issues planning on. This is Mark from DuckDuckGo. He's going to talk a little bit about privacy. Thank you for coming. Give it up. Give it up. Yeah. How's everybody doing? I'm doing good also. This is my first talk, so be gentle with me. Um, so my name's Mark Soda, and I'm director of site reliability and fraud mitigation at DuckDuckGo. I'm here to talk to you about three techniques that we've developed to, can't hear, you. Can't hear me? Better? Yeah. Sorry, I like to move around a lot when I talk, so if you see me fidgeting, that's why. All right, so I'm here to talk to you today about three te techniques that we've developed to protect our users' privacy. Um, this won't be an infomercial about DuckDuckGo. We're not gonna try to encourage anybody to switch. Um, we genuinely want other users, excuse me, we genuinely want other individuals and organizations to help us with our vision. That vision is to raise the standard of trust online. We are proof that you can run a successful tech company without knowing anything um, or collecting anything about your users. I'll admit it can be challenging at times to operate this way. When, viewing perspective, when interviewing prospective hires, I usually say something like, at DuckDuckGo, we solve hard problems just like many other tech companies do, um, but we try to make it a little bit more interesting by doing it partially blindfolded. Um, so, sorry, I got lost for a second. Uh, there are times when it would definitely be easier for us and more precise if we were able to do things like log IP addresses and user agents um, for troubleshooting information or to track users, excuse me, to, um, to use cookies to track user retention. Things like that would violate our privacy policy though and more importantly it would violate our vision. Uh, fortunately it turns out that these aren't really necessary to run a successful tech company. As I said, we're gonna talk about three things today. How we use Nginx as a proxy for all content, how we perform A-B testing to improve our product, uh, anonymous A-B testing to, uh, to improve our products, and how we automatically upgrade our users' connections to use HTTPS whenever possible. Considering my audience today, I'll skip over the part why privacy is important, as I think everybody here gets that, but I'm happy to talk about it afterwards if anybody would like. Um, Finally, before we get started, I want to point out that there are a few things that I'm not going to be talking about today, whether it's for you know, reasons like I'm not going to tell you how we do stuff uh, or how we fight fraud because that would give the other side a leg up, or just for lack of time, there's going to be a handful of things that I can't go over. Uh, I hope you'll understand, and moreover, I hope you'll believe me when I tell you that privacy is in everything that we do. Um, it's not a gimmick for us. Uh, we're a small, passionate team with a mission. That mission, uh, as I said, is to raise the standard of trust online. We want that mission to be contagious to others. And judging from recent events in the tech industry, it seems like it may be catching on, uh, particularly in the mainstream. Um, I'll try to answer questions at the end, but if I run out of time, feel free to catch up with me in between sessions. So let's first talk about how we use Nginx to uh, shield our users. We use Nginx for all of our traffic. It's extremely robust and performant, as many of you know. Uh, I'm going to go over how we use Nginx to shield our users from third-party tracking, and I'll also talk about some ways that we've lightly patched Nginx to enhance our users' privacy even further. One of our major use cases for Nginx is its baked-in reverse proxy ability. Uh, if you go to our site, you'll notice that we serve up what we call instant answers for a lot of queries. Instant answers are things like weather, um, stock prices, song lyrics, uh, things of that nature. So we have the data to complete a lot of those instant answers in-house, um, but for many others, we don't. Um, so those other ones, they need to be looked up in real time via a third party. Um, this is done asynchronously by the web browser as the results load. So take, for example, cryptocurrency exchange rates. If I search for BTC to ETH, you'll get an instant answer loaded on the results page with the exchange rates for one Bitcoin to Ethereum. However, we don't have a directly accessible database on hand to query that information for. We're not in the cryptocurrency business. So 
We have a partnership with Cryptonator. We use their exchange rates API for this information. Our users don't need to interact with Cryptonator in any way. And more importantly, Cryptonator doesn't know anything about any of our users. Um, the request to their systems is proxied through us by the user, uh, <laughs> by the user, that would be funny, for the user. Uh, so the API request comes for the exchange rate data. Um, it comes to us uh, via the user's web browser. In turn, we're proxying it with Nginx to Cryptonator's systems. Um, and that's the uh, reverse proxy functionality that's bu built into Nginx. Um, nobody in that transaction sees anything but DuckDuckGo. So whether you trust Cryptonator or not, you're not being exposed to them directly. You're trusting DDG. We use this technique for literally hundreds of sources, and Nginx makes it extremely easy for us to facilitate this. So this, the example that I just gave is pretty specific to DuckDuckGo, but there are tons more examples out there that are a lot more commonplace that site owners could and should uh, use to protect their users from. So take, for example, Gravatar. Most sites that use Gravatar link directly to their API. The user's web browser is connecting, is connecting directly to Gravatar to download an image. That interaction between the user and Gravatar is really unnecessary. Um, now, you can argue that this is somewhat of an innocent request, and I'm not making any statements about Gravatar or Automatic here. However, there is a much more serious example, um, and that is jQuery. jQuery is hosted by Google. It's used by many, many sites. Every site that allows Google to serve this content is exposing their users' browsing history to a company that, by their own admission, consumes user browsing history. The request to Google CDN can contain information like the referrer header, um, IP address, user agent, and potentially cookies. This is enough information to uniquely identify people in very many cases. Uh, if you can see the uh, EFF, uh, their Panopticlick site um, kind of elaborates on that a little bit more. Um, and in any case, it leaks, it leaks site, the sites that you're visiting to a third party. Now, unless your users are taking precautions, like using Tor or a VPN, which the great majority of them are not, then they're inadvertently and unknowingly giving up data that could expose them to all the dangers of track, uh, tracking. Proxying requests, ele proxying requests elegantly prevents all that. So let's switch gears a little bit to a few things that we've done to enhance the privacy of Nginx. First, we've applied a simple patch that redacts the IP address from the error logs. Um, surprisingly, in Nginx, there's no way to configure the error log output format. So when, error, when errors are logged, the client IP address is always part of that log line. Um, so we have a simple one-liner that redacts that IP whenever, or removes the client IP whenever um, errors are logged. Secondly, we've removed any possibility of logging IPs via another patch. It's possible to use the remote adder directive when specifying the output format for just regular old access logs in Nginx. We obviously don't use that um, because we don't store that kind of information, but we wanted to go a step further and remove the functionality altogether. So we applied another patch to redact the IP from the remote adder directive. We're willing to share these patches and even open source them if there's broader interest. Patching Nginx core might seem like it's a little bit extreme, um, but we went the extra mile here because we wanted to make sure that an actual code change was necessary to disable this functionality rather than uh, a simple configuration change. So next we're gonna talk about anonymous A-B testing. Uh, we're actually a very data-driven company. This surprises many people, as you wouldn't think there's a lot for us to go on without user information, and at times it has definitely felt like we were groping around in the dark for answers. However, we came to find that there is still data that we can use to make solid, informed decisions. I feel like I have to keep leaning in here. One way we measure engagement is by using pixel requests. These are one-by-one -one transparent pixels that are requested when certain events occur on our results page. For example, if we think you misspelled a word, we'll helpfully offer a suggestion. When the spelling message appears, a pixel is requested by the browser. And if you click on that spelling suggestion, another pixel is requested. 
Um, by logging these pixel requests, we get a rough idea of the click-through rate for the spelling suggestion. I say rough because it gives us zero information about the person who's actually making the request, um, but it does give us anonymous aggregate information about the click-through rate for that particular, um, over all of our users for that particular element. So again, there's no identifying, identifiable information on any of these pixels, and they're not linked to any other requests um, at all. Uh, information like the IP address and user agent are discarded, just like we do with everything else on our site. Um, and you can see, oh, additionally, uh, you can see that all of these requests go to improving.duckduckgo.com. Uh, we try to do this to be a little bit more transparent about what we're actually doing with these requests. And if you go to improving.duckduckgo.com, there's a link to a help page there that'll uh, be a little bit, like I said, more explicit. Um, so a lot of companies think that they can't operate without Google Analytics. One reason for this is the ability to run A-B tests. Like many companies, we A-B test most of our features, uh, most of our new features. We do it without sacrificing any of our users' anonymity. When we want to test a change, say, the text of our spelling suggestion from the previous example, we'll A-B test it. This is done using the pixel framework we just talked about. We can define an experiment whose parameters are the percentage of queries that we want to include, the number and names of the experiment groups, for example, two groups called A and B, and a URL, URL parameter that will be assigned to the group name, uh, and there's some other less interesting stuff as well. So in this example here, we're exposing the change to 50% of our queries. They're uh, split into two groups, A and B, and we're using the parameter spell EXP. The result is that when the spelling suggestion is seen or clicked on, a pixel request is made, as you can see up here. Um, notice that spell EXP, spell EXP is set to B and that our copy is using the new variant. One important thing to note here is that this is done on a per request basis, not on a per user basis. We have no concept of a user at DuckDuckGo. If I run another query, I might be assigned to the other experiment group or I may not be included in the experiment at all. After running this experiment for several days, we can build up enough data that the results will be statistically significant and we can decide whether we want to make a change or not make a change with confidence. Again, this requires no knowledge of our users. The software we used for this was developed in-house and is fairly DuckDuckGo specific right now. We're talking about open sourcing it, um, but it's really not difficult to do this on your own. All of the pixels that, we're, that we process are done so with Elasticstack, um, and we use some scripts and spreadsheets to calculate statistical significance. There's also a few open source tools out there that can uh, help you do this as well. In the meantime, feel free to reach out to us if you have an immediate need and would like some direction. These methods admittedly have some limitations when compared with more invasive non-anonymous techniques. One question that we are constantly asking ourselves is, how many actual users do we have? No one at DDG can accurately answer that question, although we believe we have a really good approximation. However, this technique gives us a great general sense of direction, and that's really all we need to improve the product. So it turned out for us, and I suspect for many other sites as well, um, that you can make intelligent data-driven data decisions without any detailed information about your user base. Also, one other nice benefit to not knowing anything about your users is you're not tempted into making any weird correlations based on demographics that usually don't apply. All right, finally, we're going to talk about HTTPS upgrading. Um, I think everyone here will agree that, H that uh, encryption is important. Um, I don't think that's a controversial topic. Uh, while HTTPS-enabled sites are at an all-time high, there is still much we can do here. Many sites don't use HTTPS by default. Of the ones that do, many are susceptible to redirect attacks and SSL stripping. Others are just not configured properly, and this leads to a false sense of security. To help maximize the use of HTTPS, our apps and extensions use a technology that we call smarter encryption. This is marketing speak for automatically upgrading HTTP connections to HTTPS whenever possible. It has a similar goal to the EFF's HTTPS Everywhere in that we 
uh, both technologies seek to upgrade your connections. However, the crucial difference is in the coverage we're able to achieve and how we maintain that coverage. Right now, our list contains about three million rules for upgrading sites. For comparison, HTTPS Everywhere contains about 166,000, and the HSTS preload list contains about 55,000. Now, to be fair, the HSTS list uses the include subdomain directive. Um, that's hard for us to quantify. Uh, in addition, the EFFs list uses regular expressions, which again are hard to qualify. Um, but the results are the same. Relying on people to submit sites manually results in a necessarily shorter list that ages quickly. The real comparison here, however, is in the coverage that we're able to achieve. Coverage here is defined as the percentage of clicks that we're able to upgrade off of our results page. HSTS covers about 7%, HTTPS Everywhere covers about 24%, and our list covers 77%. Um, by the way, we measured these link clicks with a pixel framework that we just talked about. This is really powerful because it means that our list is driven by popularity and will adjust over time. So how are we able to get such high coverage? One of the limitations in rule size for the other lists, as I alluded to earlier, is that they require people to manually submit these entries. Our list, on the other hand, is programmatically maintained. We are constantly crawling the web to find new sites to add to the list. This can be really challenging at times, um, as many sites break over HTTPS. We also have fairly strict cut criteria for inclusion on the list. So the way we do this is we first create a ranked list of candidate sites based on the links clicked on our results page. From there, we've been, we begin to crawl each site on the list with a headless browser. We try, to, we try to get at least 10 URLs for every site to maximize the surface area, and we always include the home page if it's accessible. Then we check the pages for breakage over HTTPS. First, we make sure that the HTTPS codes match, uh, excuse me, the HTTP codes match. So for example, if we get a 200 over HTTP and a two, or, uh, 500 over HTTPS, we're gonna exclude that site. Um, the exception to this is a 301 redirect, um, although we still perform the rest of the checks for this one. We then perform checks on the SSL certificate. We check for things like CA validity, name mismatches, and expiry. Finally, we perform a visual test. So we take a snapshot of each site over HTTP and then one over HTTPS. Um, this is done with a headless browser. We'll run both of those snapshots through the compare utility that's bundled with Image Magic. If there's more of a, uh, if there's more than a five percent discrepancy between the pixels, um, this the compare utility does a pixel by pixel comparison. If there's more than a five percent uh, discrepancy there, then we're going to exclude this site as well. Um, we try to account for things like dynamic content, um, but for the most part. It's usually fairly obvious when, when a site, you know, by looking at the snapshots, when a site is uh, not going to make the cut. Right now, we're currently experimenting with other comparison techniques, such as doing line-by-line -line comparisons, similar to the way the DIFF does. Um, this works, as I said, it works similar to the way DIFF does and can sometimes provide better results. So once we have the list, we publish it to our site. Our mobile apps and browser extensions periodically refresh their cached copies of the list. Um, they consume this list as a bloom filter to perform quick lookups over a small data structure in real time as you're browsing. Since our apps and extensions are open source, you can check out this code or check out the implementation if you like. Um, I mentioned that Smarter Encryption is built into our apps and extensions. It's also baked right into our results page. So anytime you do a search on DuckDuckGo, we are dynamically upgrading all of the resulting links on the page to use HTTPS. Uh, we're hoping to make this list and the crawler that builds the list freely available to everyone sometime soon. So I hope this talk gave you a good idea of how you can operate successfully while putting privacy first. These examples did not happen overnight. We put a lot of work in here. Um, we're hoping that other tech companies will adopt these practices and maybe even the techniques themselves. Privacy is an area that's becoming more and more mainstream, but more than that, it's a core value and fundamental human right that we can't continue to sacrifice in this nascent digital era. 
Thank you very much. I think we have time for uh, maybe one question. Um, but like I said, if you don't get your question answered, come find me later. I'm happy to answer anything. Go ahead. Say it again. Do we use the same cat? Oh, patch version. I'm sorry. Yes, we do. The, the question was, do we use the same patch version of Nginx internally? Yes, we do. So on the subject of Nginx, uh, you mentioned that you made some changes to that code. You have some internal tools. Uh, you said you were considering open sourcing that. Uh, what are the impediments? Why aren't you? Uh, so uh, the question was, why haven't we open sourced them already? Yeah. Um, honestly, it just it, it hasn't been a huge priority. Um, there's nothing, you know, we're not sure that people are interested in this sort of stuff. I kind of wanted it to get a feel for it here. And uh, like I said, we're happy to share them, or, and uh, we likely will open source them in the very near future. Thanks a lot, everyone.